welcome back, uh, Reverend Badoy and uh, Bishop Antoha and Dr. Lim. Thank you very much for your inspirational presentation. Now, this is time for panel discussion. And uh, I want to raise only one issue. Okay, all of you mentioned about church planting is needed in the Philippines. However, um, in the presentation paper of Dr. Lim, he said that, frankly, many of these efforts, including church planting or some issues, have, been, uh, have not been appreciated by the people who have been helped, evangelized, and churched. So uh, it looks like, a, it seems like a little bit conflict. But both of all of you were talking about church planting also. So in what sense, how the church planting is needed in the Philippines? And uh, some of participants are involved in church ministries. Then in what essential issues, in what areas do they need to focus on while they are involved in church ministry? And thirdly also, in relation to church planting ministry, how, how can Korean missionaries pa have partnership with the Filipino churches and Filipino organizations? Okay, Bishop Fantoa, can you kindly yeah, open? Thank you very much, um, Reverend Lee. Um, in the uh, brochure that I have uh, provided for you, this is a research that's uh, uh, made, and it's in a continuing process. So every day, there's research being made. So the number of churches in 2015 is 66,000. It grew to 72,000 in February 2017. So these 72,000 churches does not include only the PCEC, but it, this includes all the Bible believing, including the Protestants. So in the Protestants, the NCCP, the uh, Methodists, the Episcopalians, Anglicans in the Philippines is included here. And uh, of course, Salvation Army is there and uh, Yemeli, Unida, so all 11 uh, denominations and organizations uh, individually, individually uh, have agreed like the Dawn 2000. How many of you remember Dawn 2000 movement? So in the Dawn 2000 movement, the last uh, time, uh, the, all the churches in the Philippines coordinated and worked together uh, for church multiplication, church planting is done 2000. So this is a new, um, um, it, this is a new program that unites the whole body of Christ together. And so these 72,000 churches is the whole thing, the whole number of churches. Number of RP barangays, this is the total number. But we have identified, the Philippine challenge have identified barangays without church, and that's 20,000. So if you are in a region, okay, or in a province, or in a city, there is a research going on there uh, by Philippine Challenge and PCEC. So it's important if you are in that area, connect with the ministerial association, okay? Uh, it's good that you are there, but it's good to connect, uh, meet if there's a ministerial fellowship that's uh, uh, going on there so that there will be coordination. Also with regards to unchurched barangays. So you, you don't go uh, because uh, oh, we want that, we have identified that. With the help of uh, this organization, they know this is the neediest barangay. Please go there. So that there will be no congestion in uh, one place or one city. So coordination is very important, and also reporting the number. I don't, I, I don't know how many are church planters here. Uh, may, may I see the hand? 
of those who are doing church planting. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so at least the, the church planters, we want to know and we want your efforts to be included in the number. Maybe your church is not included in the 72,000. But if we will hear from you, it will be 72,001 already. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So church planting is still needed in the Philippines. Yes. But effectively, in order to make church plant effectively, yeah, coordination is needed coordination. between not to just church plant by yourself, but before that, concert with Philippine organization. Yeah. You have to look for unchurched place. Yes. 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 Thank you very much, sir. Can I comment? Sure, sir. Uh, we have actually categorized uh, Filipinos into three, three. I mean, uh, into three categories. So, so when we do, we can do same culture ministry. So like Ilocano to Ilocano, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Batangueño to Batangueño. So that's one, same culture ministry. Another is cross-culture, and another is cross-culture and rich. Because um, uh, the, uh, the problem always when we do missions mobilization is, they would say we are involved in cross-cultural ministry. Yes. What we mean is and rich, what they mean is simply cross-cultural. So a church in Batangas having an outreach in summer is cross-cultural, which is correct, but it's not cross-cultural and rich. So a PMA, our bias is cross-cultural and rich because we want the Great Commission completed. But in these three areas, we need church planting. We need to continue church planting, same culture, church planting, cross-culture, and cross-cultural and rich church planting is also needed. So those are three, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, Dr. Lim. Uh, I just have two comments on that. Yes. First is on uh, church planting. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who have, are here, most probably you will be appreciated uh, by your Filipino colleagues. Mm -hmm. But what I write in my paper are many of the Korean missionaries who have had bad experiences working with Filipinos. Oh. And I'm sure some of you had those initial experiences and learned from it, praise God. But you see, uh, in any ministry, very important is how do you relate to your co-workers. Okay? One way is to be a servant leader by becoming a friend or a partner of this person. The other way is to treat this person as an employee or a hireling. You know, you pay him uh, some, uh, something, then you expect something from him, and that kind of relationship uh, is going to become bad. Okay? So I'm sure you experienced that uh, or saw it in others. Uh, so it's the whole, the whole uh, question of servant leadership. And if you really are a good servant leader, and I'm sure all of you here are that kind, you have learned how to do it. Once you leave your region or your ministry, people will love you and cry because you leave. They love you. But there is the other side where uh, behind your back, uh, they can be whispering uh, that good, he is leaving us. Uh, in other words, you are not appreciated. So that's what I mean, that there are missionaries who are not appreciated uh, by the time they leave, uh, the people feel, wow, at last, we can now take over. <laughs> uh, now, when we come to uh, church planting in an area, I hope there, there can be a common project 
uh, with PCEC or with uh, Philippine Challenge to have a common understanding that anyone who plants a church uh, should register it uh, in a list of, with KMAP or, or with PCEC or with uh, Philippine Challenge so that we will be able to know who are working together. But more important is what happens on the ground. And that is anybody who plants any church must make a decision to say that I will work with other churches in the same barangay or municipality or city. Now, that kind of a commitment is that I will meet at least once a month with uh, the fellow pastors of other churches in the same barangay or in the same city, uh, at least to pray together or at least uh, try to help one another. Uh, then the unity of the church uh, can be seen uh, on the barangay level or on the uh, city level. How can Korean missionaries equip and train and help local Filipino Christians, global Christians? How can we encourage them to take part in world mission in their own context? Can you kindly give us more specific idea and uh, some methodology for all of us? If I may go back quickly to the first question on uh, church planting. And this one is really serious, and I want to be very blunt and honest about this. Because I work with denominations. In PCEC, there are 78 denominations. At NCCP, there are 11 denominations. And um, some Filipino uh, pastors and denominational leaders have resented uh, the new works that are being, you know, being started by Korean missionaries, especially. Because when they come into a place, uh, these missionaries are money missionaries. They have money, okay? And in some barangays, for example, there's a, I heard this story in Zambales, that one missionary came, okay? And uh, he wants to start new works. So he contacted the pastors there and asked, how many of you need help with regards to building? We will help you build your churches. And these are from denominations. You know, there's Baptist, there's Assemblies of God, there's uh, Alliance. And so this missionary came and helped raise funds for the building of these or already organized churches. And these buildings were named after you know, uh, the, the church. And so some Filipino pastors became unhappy that their pastors were, sorry to say this, stolen or pirated by the Korean missionary. This happened in the past. And uh, that's why some Filipino denominations and Filipino pastors are not very happy when there's a new Korean missionary because they think he's another one who would do the same. But it has been corrected in the past, and we do not want that to happen again. That's why cooperation is always welcome. You know, when a new missionary ca uh, come, for example, to... San Antonio Zambales. It's good to meet all the pastors. I'm here. I want to cooperate. Okay? And uh, I will not invite you to my denomination. <laughs> uh, I will help you. And I will not steal your sheep. <laughs> okay? But I will cooperate and I will start a brand new one. So cooperation, coordination is very important. Now, the second part is how do we uh, train? When, when a new church is started, of course, uh, the main uh, purpose is to evangelize the new believer. 
Disciple them to become strong so that they will serve their local churches. But the more advanced uh, part of training is uh, to mobilize these new members to become missionary so that they will not stay only in their local church but would have the passion, would have the heart to leave his local church and go to another place to help establish a new work. So, uh, uh, you know, different levels from evangelism to discipleship and becoming a leader in a local church and then becoming a missionary. That can be intentionally done if, if uh, the, the planning of a church planter would go to do, those levels. Not just making this church strong, have a building and have good funds, but have a missionary uh, intentionally have these people, train these people to have a heart for mission. Thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> we, that's why PMA actually rewrote our mission vision because we believe that the best way to uh, do uh, multiply disciples and plant churches is to really uh, cultivate movements. So uh, PMA, for example, we have a higher purpose training uh, where we actually help believers understand that where you live, where you work, where you study, that's your mission field. God in his wisdom place you there. And therefore, uh, you are you know, a royal priest. You are God's minister there. And therefore, you are responsible to share the gospel, make disciples, in fact, multiply disciples, so that as a result, there would be a church that can be started in your office or in your community or even in your campus if you're a student. Uh, it's a very simple uh, training that we do. And in fact, uh, we just focus on several biblical principles, the priesthood of all believers, every believer is a minister. And then we incorporated disciple-making movement and we simply use a company tree booklet, which uh, actually would help participants uh, or those in training to be able to start, you know, conversation and also how to multiply disciples. So here, here is the material that we use. Uh, when you give, we, we discovered when you give them a thick manual or several pages, uh, normally the response is, I cannot do it. But if you give them just one like this, they said, I can do it. So it's uh, one thing that we can share, and we have seen it working, and uh, we're really excited about what God is doing. So um, disciple-making movement using Company 3. So we, we actually um, prepared, uh, we have a structure uh, that we show the, the participants or those that are being trained so that uh, there is a structure there for training, for mentoring, for coaching, for accountability, for monitoring, uh, even for uh, providing care and for exponential growth. So uh, if they go to the training, they would be able to understand how, they, how it would work and how they are able to multiply disciples where they live, work, or study. And the good thing here is that it is seamless. Uh, you can use it for uh, whatever religious background, for Buddhists, for Hindus, for Muslims. So we just use one material rather than different materials depending on focus and again it's very simple that's why it's very transferable and it can easily reproduce and therefore easily multiply uh, another uh, training that we provide is actually harvest connection which is just uh, one day training uh, it's also based from perspectives and uh, we have seen it very effective to mobilize churches in fact, uh, missions organizations uh, have already adopted it, like Send International, OM, CPMT, and several others, because they have seen it's very effective as a tool to mobilize churches. It only runs for one day. And the good thing is uh, we got the rights for the materials. No? So uh, you can even produce your own materials uh, because uh, we asked for mission and we were given. And so you don't feel guilty when, when you produce materials. 
And uh, this is also to help us facilitate, especially when we train uh, in a Filipinos or other believers in restricted access countries where we cannot bring in materials. No, so that's the, the advantage. And uh, the good thing there also is that it's short, it's one day. Secondly, uh, it has videos, video available so that you, if you are not that uh, capable yet in facilitating, you can use the video and just facilitate the discussion. Uh, there's a tool, an inventory part of the activity where uh, participants will be able to determine their role in the Great Commission. Are they intercessors? Are they senders? Are they goers? Uh, so it's good. Uh, I did this in Cebu Gospel, and uh, one of the businessmen after the training said, now I understand uh, my role in the Great Commission. I'm a sender, meaning uh, God, that's the reason why he said, God bless me and my business. Uh, no wonder I experience so much joy when I give and support our church missions program. So, you know, they begin to realize what the role is. Several women after the training said, now we realize why one hour prayer meeting is so short for us because we are intercessors. So, you know, realizing the role would really encourage them uh, to, to, to do more uh, uh, as God designed them and, and as what is expected of them. And then, of course, another in, uh, activity f within that course, uh, one-day course, is uh, there would be an, uh, an inventory where you will try to evaluate your own church. How missions mobilize is your church. You know, we have different parameters to, 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 see, to say that this is a mobilized church. But what they did is they work on all the various churches globally and they, uh, they got eight common best practices of churches that are missions mobilized. So based on the eight best practices, that would be your parameter now, your benchmark in evaluating your church. So the good thing is it's not a fast and pale test, but it will help you realize which areas you are weak so you can work on that. So as a result, your church will really become missional. So just for one day, uh, this is all part of that. And um, again, it's, a, uh, it's an amazing tool to be able to mobilize for, for missions. And so uh, as a result, we are seeing uh, you know, churches uh, started same culture, cross-culture, and even cross-cultural unreached. So these are the two main trainings that we actually offer in PMA. Of course, uh, Kairos is being offered also. We have a lot of facilitators plus other trainings. But uh, we, we thought we just run the short ones. No? So Harvest Connection one day, Higher Purpose, uh, and using disciple making movement is also one day. So we would love to partner with you if you have uh, training schools or or uh, you know partner with you in your respective areas so that we can mobilize and and even train more people and that would really pass track our church planting in different aspects. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, there's really no need to even partner. Just invite PMA. He is the most important person here. <laughs> Just contact PMA and tell them we want one day or two day training on how our church members can be mobilized for missions. And uh, he will take care as to what are the <laughs> trainings they, they have. Uh, if you want a longer one so that everyone is educated as if they went to a Bible school, then ask for four days. Four days, huh? That's our, uh, uh, four days. Uh, yeah. yeah actually, For Kairos. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have short ones. If you want long, longer ones, we can actually ex expand it. You know, so we, we, we really would want to identify first what are the basic uh, things that, you know, every believer should know. And we give them that. And in the process, you know, we... We just assist them. We men that's where coaching and mentoring comes in, where we journey with churches in areas that they need growth. So we, we would love to do that. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, is really in our heart in PMA is to establish a centers in key areas. Actually, it's a center for evangelism, discipleship, church planting, and missions. So that any church in the area who would think, 
I want to be involved in church planting or missions or evangelism or discipleship, there is a place where they can go. And it's very interesting because uh, in, in uh, last Saturday in Iligan, uh, the pastors there said, we need to come up with something like this. And they all agreed, let's have a center. So they are ready for that. And what is amazing is there's a businessman who owns a place and he said, I will provide a place. So now they have a place and, and the pastors uh, and the leaders there said, okay, we will make sure there will be people assigned. So if there are six days a week, like Monday to Saturday, we need just 12 people, one Monday morning, one Monday afternoon. So every day, somebody will be in the center to man it. And then, so churches or individuals who want help in areas of evangelism, discipleship, church planting, and missions can just go there. And so the center will now facilitate trainings and whatever resources. So we will partner with Philippine Bible Society for Bibles that would be needed, gospel tracts. Uh, you know, Campus Crusade made a commitment to provide some teaching videos. Uh, Asia Pacific Media and many others uh, have also already signified uh, to help. So maybe this is one area where we can collaborate also uh, that uh, you can uh, provide whatever resources you have already at hand uh, in the, so that we can put it in the resource center. Or if you have a, resource, uh, a place already in your area and you say, we would want this to be a resource center for this uh, area, then uh, we, we can work on details. So uh, we're excited because uh, uh, th this is happening now. And then uh, next week we'll be in Baguio. There were, uh, there were uh, uh, people, 25 already people who volunteered to run the center in Baguio. What we need now is a place. So please pray with us. Or if you know somebody who has a place, can provide it for free because we don't have budget for that, then we will now have a center in Baguio that can help facilitate this. So we want this in key areas. If the Lord is speaking to you and in your respective areas and with the same heart to come up with something like this, let's talk because we want this in key areas in the Philippines and I believe this will fast track what we want to do and see, you know, discipleship, all the nations, and even church planting, even among the unreached peoples. And of course, the OFW phenomenon uh, is really amazing, and, and the stories, uh, we don't have time, that's why I cannot tell stories also, but amazing how God is using Filipinos in different parts of the world. And since you are also here, you were instrumental in many Filipinos coming to Christ and disciple, being in, involved also in discipling them, then uh, it's also good that we can partner to prepare them to be engaged in the harvest. Uh, but, but there are three, uh, this is my observation, there are three basic skills that is really necessary. And if there are three trainings we need to give our people, they need to learn how to share the gospel. Number two, they need to learn how to do one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And then thirdly, to handle a small group, not a big group. Ten people or more, when you gather in restricted countries, you need permits. But less than that, it's easy. So that's why we just advocate company three. Two or three people, that's, you, that's what you disciple, and then uh, you know it, it will just grow and it will just multiply. Yeah, thank you. If I may, if I may. Yeah, just in, a, in addition to that. There's a church. It's a Korean Union Church of Manila. Anyone from, from that church? Korean Union Church of Manila. Once a year, they gather all the pastors in Paranaque for annual meeting. And that's uh, their way of uh, uh, helping also the Paranaque pastors uh, they allowed the use of their facility, and then uh, they would invite, invite me there and give updates on church planting. You were there also, and other pastors. So this is uh, one welcome ministry, uh, because if you have facilities in Baguio, in Lawag, or elsewhere, elsewhere, organize a meeting for Filipino pastors, invite uh, PMA or that, and that's uh, one way of relating to the Filipino pastors in the area, and at the same time, helping in the training and sharing of resources. It's so easy, uh, even without PMA. If you have a church, you can do what I did when I was a college student. 
I was inter varsity, just like David Cho. Learning, and so after graduating from college, what I did in college, when I went, became a youth pastor in the largest Chinese church in Manila. From 40 young people, it became more than 1,000 in five years. How can you do it? Ordinary students can be trained in only two, friendship evangelism and leading small groups. So all our young people are trained how to do evangelism and how to lead small groups. With that, tell them, two by two, start one group in your campus. In your, uh, if you are studying in UST or Ateneo or UP, start one. That's a Chinese in Metro Manila. So easy. Now, and if we do that, I'm sure your church will have young people who will become college graduates who will go overseas and they can do the same uh, just like what they did as students uh, starting to do that. And I'm sure uh, uh, God can bless your ministry as we mobilize every believer to be an evangelist and to lead their own small group. Uh, once they can do it, that's the secret, actually, of the Korean church growth that I saw when I was in Sodemun, Seoul, Korea, <laughs> studying in Acts. Okay? How did Cho Yong Gi? How did Yong Nak Church? How did uh, they all go? It is also Koyox. Okay? When rural people are coming to the urban center to work, who took care of them? The churches, through their uh, and in the case even of uh, Yoido Full Gospel Church, uh, they, these small groups were led by illiterate women who did not finish kindergarten. But Cho Yong Gi trained them how to lead. So on Friday mornings, they learn how to do it. Saturday or, or Sunday, uh, they can lead a small group. Uh, that is what is missing in the Korean church today. In Korea, if you want revival so that the church will no longer decline but will shoot up again, emphasize every believer becoming an evangelist and every believer leading their own kuyoks. That training, three hours on evangelism and three hours on how to lead small groups. That's enough.